now that we understand our forces, let's think about what really happens at an interface. And let's treat the interface generally. And that is usually a bad sign. When a physicist says they're going to do something generally, well, you'll see. OK, so let's draw our interface first. So we have our thin string here. And it is somehow connected to our thicker string here. And this has impedance 1, z1, which is the square root of tension times mu1. And this is z2, which is the square root of tension times mu2. And the waves we're going to think about, we're not even going to specify. We're just going to say something is moving along here, a wiggle. Maybe it's a sign, maybe it's a Gaussian pulse. And we're going to call it Fx, F1 of x minus v1 t. v1, because remember, these two uh, media have different velocities. right? This is square root of t over mu1. This is a square root of t over mu2, their wave velocities. And we can get away with doing this, because remember, any function f of x minus vt solves the wave equation. So any shape can fly down the string. Well, what's going to happen? Well, that shape might keep going. So we might have another one like this, and we're going to call it um, G2. Not G1. I'm sorry. We're going to call it F2. So F are the ones going this way. And the 1 and the 2 mean the medium they're in. And it's F of x minus V2t. So if the pulse does get by, it's going to change its speed. It's going to slow down because of the higher mass density there. And the only other thing that might happen is you might get a reflection at the interface. You might get some little pulse shape. And for things going this way, we're going to call them G. And it's in interface, it's in medium 1, so we're going to call it G1 of x. And then it's plus V1t because it's going that way. Right? Gs go this way. That's why it would be plus. And we're not going to think about one coming this way because that wouldn't happen. Right? So the disturbance of energy comes here. It hits the interface. And some of it can go forward. Some of it can come backwards. Nothing comes from the edge of the universe at us this way. So that's the three functions we're going to think about. <coughs> and we're not even saying what they are. We're just doing our x and vts. So fs and gs are traveling waves. Um, with amplitudes. So even though we didn't specify what they are, sinusoids or what, we're going to think of them as having amplitudes. And the reason is a sinusoid has an amplitude. And any pulse shape you come up with, you can make as a sum of a bunch of sinusoids. So if there's no dispersion and that shape goes down by a factor of 2 in its height, that's basically all the sinusoids going down by a factor of 2. So you can call it an amplitude, even though it's not necessarily um, a sign. So let's look at our two rules here. What would have to happen? OK, rule one is that the string can't break. OK, so the string has to be um, continuous at that interface. That means whatever is going on with f and g has to equal what's going on with or f1 and g1 has to equal f2. Um, so you can really write it this simple, f1 for all time plus g1 for all time has to equal f2 for all time. And since we're just talking about interfaces, I'm not even writing that it's at x equals the interface. I mean, everything we're talking about is at the interface. So I'm just writing these as a function of time. So there's one rule that's easy to get. And rule two is that the forces must balance. So in addition to geometrically, it has to remain a string. One way you make sure that happens is that you balance the force of the interface. You don't rip the string in half. So let's think about, then, the force at the interface due to each one of these pulses. And we know from way back thinking about these things is that it's minus t df1 dx. That's what we calculated earlier, is that the force um, is minus tension df dx. And then this one would be on the left. You would also have minus the tension d 
G1 dx. So the total force on this side would just be the sum due to the two motions, whatever they are. And those equal the right side, minus T df2 dx. Uh, let's see. So now we can convert those to impedances, like we just did on the previous couple of boards. We can say this is actually equal to impedance 1, z1 df1 dt, the same way we did a minute ago. Um, the, this has to equal the minus of that. And then this one stays negative because it's going the other way. And all that discussion of x minus vts and all those partials we messed around with, we had x minus vt. If you do x plus vt, the negative sign um, is the opposite. So this stays negative. And it's z1 dg1 dt. And those together must equal uh, z2. We're now in the other medium, df2 dt. And that's almost the rule. That's not quite the rule, because now we want to integrate with respect to time. <laughs> Real quick. And again, we're going to be very general. And you say, if we're going to integrate that with respect to time, all we're going to get is that z1 f1 minus z1 g1 equals z2 f2. And that's the other thing that has to be true. So f1 plus g1 has to be f2, and z1 f1 minus z1 g1 has to be z2 f2 to keep the forces balanced. So working with those, we can figure out what happens at the interface.